On April 29, 1998, Delaware police were examining the crime scene when a car appeared in the distance. However, without coming even a hundred meters close, the car stopped, abruptly turned around, and headed back. Detectives noticed the driver's maneuvers but didn't pay them much attention. After all, why would they? Yet little did they know that if they had pursued the mysterious driver, this story could have ended quite differently. Debbie met Nino Paglizzi when she was 21 and he was 24. They were introduced at a party when Nino jokingly asked their mutual friend Bill Sharp if there was a nice girl there that he could introduce to his mother. Bill introduced Nino to Debbie, describing her as an amazing girl. Debbie and Nino began dating and got married in 1973. For 25 years, their life was no different from millions of other contemporary couples. They had twins, Melissa and Michael, who had grown up and were attending college. The spouses were preparing to modestly celebrate their 25th wedding anniversary when suddenly everything changed. On April 29, 1998 in Delaware, it was a beautiful sunny day, and Debbie decided to plant rose bushes in front of their house. When Nino returned home, he was surprised to find her engaged in this activity, as she had never been a gardener, but was glad to see her clearly enjoying it. Debbie asked him to call her around 4 p.m. as she was expecting a call from work. Nino nodded and went inside. Debbie continued tending to the flowers when an instinctual feeling told her it had been more than four hours. She didn't pay much attention to it, assuming Nino had simply forgotten her request. The woman got up and went into the house. But before she could enter the kitchen, she felt a strong blow to her head and fell to the floor. The woman was shaken and didn't understand what was happening. Her glasses had fallen and she could barely see, but she discerned the silhouette of a stranger looming over her. He demanded to know where she kept her money. Debbie realized that a burglar had broken into the house. She lay on the floor while the man rummaged through her belongings. The thought that Nino should have come to her rescue already didn't leave her, but she was afraid that he might get hurt if he did. Meanwhile, the intruder tied her wrists and ankles and dragged her downstairs to the basement. Throwing her face down onto the concrete floor, the man violated her. Debbie writhed in pain and couldn't believe what was happening. Just 20 minutes ago, she was tending to her roses in her beloved garden, and now she was enduring this humiliation on the floor of her own home. When it was all over, the assailant pulled up his sweatpants and left. Debbie was certain that the horror had ended, but suddenly the brute returned and dragged her back up the stairs, this time from the basement. Covering her with a blanket and holding a knife to her throat, he carried her to a car parked right by the front door and put her in the trunk. Debbie was in such a state of shock that she didn't even realize that she had just been kidnapped. But she didn't have the time for that. As the man started the car, Debbie was already attempting to free herself. She wanted to loosen the bond so that when the perpetrator opened the trunk again, she could start kicking, biting, screaming, anything to escape or attract attention. But her plan failed. When he opened the trunk, Debbie realized with horror that she was already in the garage and no one would help her. The kidnapper took her back into the house. After throwing Debbie onto the bed in the room, he needed just one glance to understand that she had tried to loosen the ropes. Enraged, he cruelly punished her, viciously violating her. She begged for mercy, to be let go, she cried, but the more she pleaded for mercy, the more brutal he became. He laughed and clearly relished her agony. Debbie noticed that he was likely under the influence of some forbidden substances. Satisfying his lust, he tied her hands and feet, then tied the ropes on her wrists and ankles together, completely immobilizing her. Closing her mouth and eyes, the assailant left her. Soon, she heard two loud shots and assumed that she was saved because it must have been the police coming to her rescue. At work, Debbie's absence was quickly noticed. She worked as a hospice nurse, and her reliability and punctuality were always unquestionable. So when she couldn't be reached, around 6.30 p.m., a colleague went to her house. Noticing a neighbor of the Paglizzi family, Debbie's colleague introduced herself and asked if he had seen her neighbor. He replied that she had been planting roses in the garden and added that if she wasn't responding, the side door of the house was always open. The woman entered. The house was quiet. She called for Debbie. Her belongings, including her wedding ring, were on the kitchen table and her glasses were on the floor. The woman continued calling for Debbie and Nino. Debbie was nowhere to be found, but she found Nino in the bedroom. It was evident that he couldn't be helped anymore. Someone had shot him in the head. Debbie saw the kidnapper only the next day, 
He recounted how he thought the police had discovered him because he saw the headlights aimed at his windows. He fired two shots from the window and now worried that the neighbors might have heard or seen something. Then he turned up the radio or the television loudly. The news program started, and with horror, Debbie heard that Anthony Paglizzi, Nino, had been shot in his own home. The police named her a fugitive and suspected her of her husband's murder. Until that moment, it hadn't even crossed her mind that something had happened to Nino. To her, it seemed that everything had happened very quickly. She entered the house, a stranger attacked her, and her husband didn't even know where she was. Debbie couldn't fathom that her kidnapper had harmed Nino. The man unexpectedly apologized for having to kill her husband and simply left the room, leaving the shaken woman behind. It was very difficult for her to grasp what she had just learned. She realized that her assailant was not only a robber and a violator, but also a murderer, which meant she would be his next victim. She also understood that she couldn't mourn her husband because it would only provoke the man further. Debbie could only think about her children. Of course, they were grown-ups, but they had to deal with two terrible shocks, their father being killed and their mother disappearing and being accused of his murder. Meanwhile, detectives interviewed friends and family, but they were no closer to understanding who killed Nino. Everyone unanimously testified that the two had a wonderful relationship. They never fought, and the neighbors never heard any screams. Moreover, Debbie would never leave the house without her glasses, because she couldn't see anything without them. The police couldn't imagine that their main suspect was just five miles away, fighting for her life. During a follow-up interview, the neighbor recalled that although he hadn't heard any screams, he saw a car parked right in front of the family's house. A man had put a blanket in the trunk and driven away. Detectives indeed found tire tread marks on the lawn right outside the house, which was highly unusual for such an affluent neighborhood. Combined with Debbie's glasses lying on the kitchen floor, without which she couldn't see anything, the police concluded they were dealing with a kidnapping. After 52 hours, the kidnapper revealed a different side of himself. He untied his victim and spoke to her like a normal person. This was highly unusual because before this, he had barely uttered more than a few words to her at once. The man admitted that he was considering letting her go, but was afraid she would describe his house to the police. Debbie seized upon these words. If he was considering it, she needed to convince him to truly release her. Addressing him respectfully as sir, she assured him that she wouldn't tell anyone about him especially since she could barely see without her glasses. She also had no idea where the house was because he had brought her in the trunk. But as quickly as the spark of hope arose for Debbie, it extinguished when he stated that he couldn't let her go. Then, as if thinking aloud, he remarked that if he got rid of all the illicit substances in the house, he would face no more than 10 years in prison. Debbie realized she was dealing with someone not very intelligent. Could he be so naive as to think that murder, kidnapping, and assault only led to 10 years? She decided to use her wits to make him see her not as a victim, but as a person. She calmly talked to him, and this tactic proved successful. That night, he removed the bindings from her mouth and eyes and allowed her to sleep in his bed. On the morning of the third day, the kidnapper told Debbie that she needed to take a shower. The man wouldn't let her into the bathroom, and there was indeed a need for it. However, after spending so much time bound, Debbie didn't feel the strength to stand under the water. She asked for a bath, and he agreed. It was uncomfortable for her to undress and bathe in front of a stranger, but that was the least of her worries. Seeing that she had finished, the man asked if she intended to wash her hair. She replied that it was impossible in her current state. Her hands and wrists were so swollen and painful that she couldn't even lift them, so he washed her hair himself. For Debbie, it felt like another act of violence, and she was uncomfortable letting her husband's killer touch her hair, but she kept her emotions in check. After the bath, the man forced her to put on his clothes and violated her again. Only on the fourth day did the kidnapper suddenly remember that Debbie needed to eat. When he went out for food, she asked him to buy a newspaper. Strangely enough, he complied. They ate together and read the newspaper. It mentioned that the police had no suspects, and Debbie had been mentioned by her family in the past, which greatly upset her, although she didn't show it. However, the kidnapper seemed very pleased and even appeared proud of himself. He believed he had committed the perfect crime because no one knew where she was and no one suspected him. On the 24th of April, on the fifth day of her captivity, the kidnapper informed Debbie that he was going to work. He had said this multiple times before, even though he returned within 20 minutes, presumably to check on her. Nevertheless, 
Debbie decided that today was the day if she was going to escape. Complaining about the excruciating pain in her wrists, she told him that if he wanted to keep her alive and well, he needed to come up with something else. The man agreed to replace the ropes on Debbie's wrists and ankles with handcuffs and grumbled displeasedly that she was becoming expensive for him. When asked what he meant, he replied that they cost $5 each. In other words, he fed her only once, spent $10 on handcuffs, and probably wouldn't spend much more. She needed to get out urgently. Putting the handcuffs on her ankles and wrists, he tied them together with a rope, repeated loudly that he was going to work, and closed the door. Bound with the rope, she couldn't move her hands, but the handcuffs allowed her to move her wrists. However, Debbie didn't hurry and proved to be right. After about an hour, she heard the front door open and close quietly. Debbie realized that the test had passed. She started moving her hands, loosening the rope connecting the two handcuffs. Then she cautiously approached the door and froze in fear. What if he was still standing behind the door and became enraged, seeing that his victim had freed herself? Debbie tried to calm herself when she heard her husband's voice saying, Hold on, dear. Gathering her strength, she prepared to either escape or die in that house and opened the door. There was no one behind it. In the darkness, Debbie felt her way to the living room, where she noticed the telephone. Managing to grab it with her bound hands, she dialed 911. Debbie provided her name to the operator, but unfortunately he didn't recognize it. So she explained that her husband had been killed and she had been kidnapped. The operator asked where the perpetrator was at the moment, and she replied that he was at work but could return before the police arrived. Fortunately, the police were able to trace the call and arrived in less than six minutes. The operator remained on the line with her the whole time, reassuring her and assuring her that the police were on their way. When the officers finally broke in, all the emotions that Debbie had been holding back for almost a week burst out. Grief from the loss of her husband, the abduction, the violence and the unexpected rescue all merged into one whole. Debbie was taken to the hospital where she finally saw her children and other relatives who had gathered from all over the country to support Michael and Melissa. It was a very strange mix of feelings. Everyone was overshadowed by Nino's murder, but at the same time they were relieved to see Debbie alive. The police had no trouble identifying the owner of the house where Debbie was held. Donald Flagg worked at a factory and in his spare time, robbed and assaulted women. Donald did not resist and confessed to everything. Moreover, he clarified some points that were not known to the police. On that day, he was simply passing by the Paglisi family's house and saw Debbie tending to the roses. Setting his eyes on her, he entered the house and waited in the kitchen. Debbie did not hear the shot because of the construction nearby and the working lawnmowers. After the assailant kidnapped Debbie, he suddenly realized that he had not stolen anything from the house, missing an excellent opportunity to enrich himself. He returned to the victim's house, but the police working at the crime scene had already surrounded it. Detectives saw a car stop abruptly and turn around, but at that time they had no reason to chase the driver. Only later did they learn that it was their suspect. Despite the man's confession, his lawyer convinced him to plead insanity. Therefore, Debbie had to testify in court. Fortunately, her psychologist had prepared her well, he asked Debbie to look at the assailant's photo more often and call him by name to get used to his face and not show too many emotions. This worked perfectly. In court, she not only remained calm, but even looked directly at her tormentor, forcing him to avert his gaze. Despite all the efforts of the lawyer, Donald Flagg was found guilty. The judge sentenced him to eight consecutive life imprisonments, plus an additional 166 years. Moreover, for 10 years, he will be in solitary confinement from April 20th to 24, the days when Debbie was in captivity. Debbie herself is glad that he will not harm anyone else. She refused to attend violence victim groups, which she later regretted. She needed to speak out, but her family did not want to discuss what had happened with her because it was too difficult for them. Debbie found healing by helping other victims of assault. She wrote a book about her experience, which became required reading in some universities in the United States gave lectures, and even helped the Delaware Rescue Service change its methods of operation to locate the caller much faster. Debbie even found the strength to meet Donald in prison and ask him the question that had tormented her all this time. Was he planning to kill her? He answered yes, he had no intention of letting her go alive. Learning about what happened to Debbie Bill Sharp, the same Bill who once introduced her to Nino, contacted her. They met in person during Debbie's difficult trial process and talked. More precisely, 
Bill allowed Debbie to speak out and listen to her. He began attending therapy sessions with her, and the psychologist, seeing them together, immediately understood that his support was truly healing for her. Being a real source of support and comfort for Debbie, Bill became her husband in September 2000. 